I've been a student of the Bible for a long time, studying and searching for the truth. As a Bible teacher in the United States, I've been asked if Israel's United Kingdom really existed. Were the first kings of Israel real? Are the biblical narratives of events like David and Goliath accurate? My name is Jeremy D. Hutt, and I've met up with Barry Britnell, a seasoned traveler and close friend. He's been to Israel close to a dozen times, and he'll be my guide on our journey through this country. We're going to talk to experts in the field of archaeology and examine the geography, comparing everything to what the Bible says. We're going to be able to visit a number of places that have bearing on the United Kingdom. I think we should begin our journey where the scriptures begin. The story of the United Kingdom begins at Shiloh. Did Shiloh exist? Was it a real place? Does it match the location of the biblical text? Does the function of the city serve the same function that it did in biblical text? Was it a holy site where sacrifices offered there? Those are all questions that I think can be helped by the study of archaeology. Back in the 1980s, Israel Finkelstein led an Israeli dig here, and you can see the work that they did exposing the big fortification wall that surrounds the entire perimeter. What we have done is take his work, and on the other side of us, the work that the Danish did in the 1920s and 1930s, and we're connecting the two. Now, the tabernacle supposedly was here for several hundred years. Do you have any places here at the site where you think it stood? It's all about the Mishkan, which is the presence of God, and I think it answers that most basic of all human questions, like how do I connect with God? The tabernacle gives us a way to do that, and this is why it's so critically important. And in the center of it is the Ark of the Covenant. These are the main ideas. Was the tabernacle on the northern platform outside the city wall? Was it on the summit, the apex of the tell? Number three, it could have been on the southern approach. There's four churches on the southern approach. Mm -hmm. Well, the Christians seem to really like the idea of the tabernacle being there because they're building their churches there on that spot. Yeah. May have also been functional. It's very flat and it could have fit over there. Now, I've introduced a fourth possibility, and that's that the tabernacle may have been mobile at Shiloh. Mm -hmm. It was not in one spot. By its very nature, it's mobile. Right. They are slaughtering a large volume of animals. Certain times of the year, if you've got the tabernacle set up, say, down here, and the wind is blowing this direction, <laughs> it's just going to be unbearable and not hygienic. Maybe seasonally, the tabernacle is moving around Shiloh, so it's not that one side is sacred, maybe the whole side is sacred. And are you finding evidence for Israelite presence on this site during the Iron Age when Samuel was supposed to have been here? Oh, absolutely. We've got abundant evidence of that. You see a transition here from the Amorites who dwelled, sometimes we say Canaanites, but in the hill country, they're Amorites actually that were living here. In some ways, you can see that a different ethnic group or a different theological persuasion has come in. Do we see a shift in the material culture? Do we have Hebrew inscriptions and writing? Yes, we do. So there's no doubt that in the period of the tabernacle, that there were Israelites at Shiloh. We're just inside this five and a half meter wide perimeter wall that went all the way around the site. And what we have are storage rooms that are built against this. What we're after is an understanding of the stratification of our site. And you can see the separation where we've got a lot of tumble, crumbly, grayish material into a brownish, reddish soil down to about right here. So that's about a 10 inch spread. Now we know we're changing time periods. Something definite happened right here. We're reading the book. What we believe is that this represents the Iron Age right here. This is the period of the tabernacle at Shiloh. We've got late bronze, middle bronze underneath this layer and Hellenistic and Roman above this layer. Kind of trim the bulk so that you get a better look at it. When I do, we're gonna lose this piece. So now we can get a good look at that. That's been worked, hasn't it? That is so light. So that's clearly man-made. It's pumice. So put it in our finds bucket right there. As we trowel through, there's a nice piece of pottery. Looks like a rim. So this is a whole mouth vessel. This looks like it's from the Iron Age, probably Iron Two. 
Now here's a bone. What type of animal bones are you finding here and in what quantities? We found two to three times the quantity of animal bone here at Shiloh in season one than we have found at our other excavations. And I think that's, a, we've got good reason for that. Yeah. We have an ancient text, the Bible, that indicates that there was a cultic site that operated a sacrificial system here. There was a massive favisa or bone deposit in area D over here on the east, only bones from the biblical sacrificial system within that bone deposit. And interestingly, we get about 1% pig bone. In the pre-Israelite period, it's 4%. And then when you move into the Israelite period, it's 1%. That's a significant drop. Yeah. And so again, that's an ethnic indicator that there's a change in who's living at the site, or at least their value systems or their, their cultic understandings have changed. So the bones are very interesting to us. Okay, that's charred pottery, that's good. We've got the naked eye of the trained volunteer. Then we have a metal detectorist checking. Now we're checking a third time. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to go through wet sifting for a, a fourth time. We found that when we dry sifted things many times, you could have something as important as a scarab that still looks like a clot of dirt. Hmm. And when you wash it with a hose, wow, you, you realize the things that you've been missing. Maybe we're going to have markings on here. Yeah, we're already seeing grit. We could have Hebrew lettering on here. You can already see, look at the difference between the pottery that we've washed and what we haven't washed. So it's popping. Sometimes we're wanting to do analysis. So I want to double check everything before we publish it. So we'll take something like this, for example, and when we get in the lab, we'll look at it under a microscope. And I have a feeling I'm seeing part of a Hebrew letter there but I'm not, not sure it could be a random marking, so I want to get it under a microscope. So let's pull out these pieces, and when we're in the lab, we'll analyze them more closely and see exactly what we've got. The development of the central place of worship for the Israelites through the United Monarchy is an important thing to follow. And I think the text implies that Shiloh was actually destroyed by the Philistines after the death of Eli and his sons and the loss of the Ark. The central place of worship started there, and then it moved. I was thrilled just to go to the site. Scott knows of a lab near Jerusalem. It's in an undisclosed location. A number of these labs have artifacts that are valuable, or they may be politically or religiously sensitive, and so they don't like to advertise exactly where these labs are located. Our lab is pretty unique here in Israel. You find a space that's available, you get good lighting, you've got tables together, a microscope, water, perhaps some chemicals and brushes and tools, and this is the way that we work. Some of these artifacts that we excavated, then we're able to look at them under magnification and see some things that we couldn't tell in the field, obviously. And I know one of the things that really caught your attention was this jar, looking to see if there are any markings that we missed, any lettering, anything that's intentional around the rim, and I'm also looking at the size of the inclusions, and it's exactly what we would expect. So we would pretty confidently date that then to iron two. Maybe once every season we get a whole vessel, and we get about 2,000 broken pieces a day. When it has writing on it, a shirt becomes an ostracon, and now it is elevated in importance sure. to a whole other level. Sure. Yeah. Uh, this also caught our eye. It's pumice. Why did it catch our eye? Because it's not native. To Shiloh. I mean, somebody brought this north. from up north where we have the volcanic material up in the Golan. It's clearly man made, it's clearly worked. And it is kind of exciting sometimes when you look under here, you'll end up seeing a letter or a little bit of gold that's embedded that you didn't expect to see that gives you a clue. That's an interesting piece. Now, the bone analysis at Shiloh is critically important because we're dealing with a biblical sacrificial system. What you were saying at the site earlier was that that percentage is consistent 
with an Israelite occupation, that you see oh, that percentage of pig bone go down to 1%. Well, when you're moving from, say, an Amorite-controlled culture to an Israelite culture, you see a significant drop in the percentage of pork that they're consuming. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about fairy tales here. No, we're we're talking about real people, real places, and real events. Notice now, under magnification, we can see ridges and lines and all kinds of things. When I sit with our zoo archaeologist, I'm just fascinated. The things that, that she's seeing there that I wasn't. Okay, yeah, see if you can see that collagen there. When you've got that collagen, you're able to do radiocarbon testing on that. That's right. Once it's all been preserved and it's been analyzed and you want to hang on to it for a while, where does it go? We have a storage unit at the Israeli Antiquities Authority that's devoted to our material. Every one of these has an object number assigned to it. So when we want to go back and retrieve it for further study, we can easily get it out. So I hope you have high expectations and no matter how high they are, they're going to be exceeded. So this is one of my favorite places, guys, because you can see that it's floor to ceiling artifacts and it's super organized. How big so, is this place? Oh, this is the size of a couple of football fields. Wow. Just think back to the famous Indiana Jones scene where yes. they're storing the Ark of the Covenant. Welcome to that warehouse. In archaeological terms, when we're talking about the United Kingdom, we're talking about what we would call Iron One, or the transition between Iron One and Iron Two. This entire section is Iron One material, which would be roughly from about 1200 to 1000. So if you want to understand what the period of the judges would like, and that transition mm -hmm. from, say, Samuel into Saul, what was the material culture like, this is it. This is what we would call a collared rim jar. Very typically Israelite. You find one of these, for example, inside a four-room house with an absence of pig bones, mm -hmm. and now we've, we've got ethnic indicators that we're dealing with a different material culture than had preceded them. The pottery is somewhat static at the beginning because, remember, God had told them, you're going to live in houses you didn't build. You're going to occupy cities right. you did not construct. They really don't know a whole lot about pottery making at this point. So when they come in, let's say around the year 1400, mm -hmm. the pottery types don't really change much until around the year 1200. So those first couple of centuries, they're very homogenous with the Canaanite, Amorite culture that's here. Which makes sense. They're learning from They're them. learning how, right. how, to, how to make pottery. Well, one of the reasons I appreciate coming to a place like this and looking at this and learning about it is because Quite frankly, I don't know that much about pottery. And so there's a separation between what I know and what I need to know. And I think in doing so, we understand the context of the way those verses are written and the people of the time. For most people, when they hear pottery or the study of pottery, they would just naturally think, that has got to be so boring. <laughs> Digging up <laughs> broken ceramics out of the dirt, it's got to be all the same. And what you've shown us is it's not. No, it's not. It shows the development of a culture, artistic expression, and it's fascinating. One of the greatest things about my job is that I learn something new every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yes, I'm an expert, but all that has done is give me the uh, ability to understand how much I don't know so that then I can add to it. I just had this strong desire to understand their culture then and there in the setting so that I can peel the whole thing back and reevaluate what I believed and why I yeah. believed it, set it in a context and go from there. I think there's a resurgence in that. I think that there, even the, the generation coming behind us, there's a strong desire for that information. You mentioned that you can attempt to triangulate a time period by using several different methods. What are those methods? Okay, so we look at pottery, mm -hmm. coins, mm -hmm. because when you have a new person in power, it'll say year three of, and then we also can use scarabs. The Latin word scarabus means beetle, and so what we have are each one of these in the shape of a beetle. Look at that. What you have is each pharaoh, when he comes to power, he creates his own iconography for that administration. So we have very good dates in Egypt and no future pharaoh ever uses that same iconography. Mm -hmm. So when we can get a scarab in a clear 
archaeological context, we can use it to date everything else. All of these scarabs would have had gold on it. So at some point at that. before these scarabs were discarded, somebody pulled the gold off of them. <laughs> but this one, it got left behind. So you can see how beautiful this would have been. Yeah. We do get them down into the Iron Age. At Kirbid el Makata, we found one from the Iron II period, mm -hmm. Samtik Scarab, which was the first one ever found here in Israel, so it was pretty significant. So there are a very, very valuable means of dating. There's a school of thought that increasingly doesn't believe that the United Monarchy existed. Mm. They think that the, the stories of Saul and David and Solomon are propaganda pieces for an Israel government. With all the time that you've spent researching and digging in Israel, what do you think about that theory? Well, we have two schools of thought. We have the minimalists, which are saying, well, they existed, but it wasn't exactly what the Bible described. Then we have another group, mythicists, that are just total deniers that it didn't even happen at all. We have found the opposite. We have found in the material culture, if the Bible says that there was a river, we can find the river. If there was a mountain, a city was in a certain place. We find just many, many synchronisms that passes the smell test. Yeah. It's what you would expect to see from the literary description that you have. And so we have found just a lot of direct synchronisms between the archeological data and the biblical text. The time that you've spent researching and digging and exploring the physical material is that it's reinforced your faith. Right, I was a Christian before I began excavating. So it did not bring me to faith but it never scared me to examine the tough questions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do have questions where we scratch our heads, but in archeology span we say that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because something happened, let's say a city was burned and we can't find evidence of it, well, a lot of things could have happened to that burn. Yeah. Wind and rain and future yeah. peoples could have scraped the foundations clean. We've only excavated about 5% of the land of the Bible. 95% is still underground. And so when we do have some sort of gap between what we expected when we read the text and what we find in the culture, you think there might be some clues in the other 95%. There's some potential there. Our direct goal is not to prove the Bible or to bring people to Christ, but in the process, is there an apologetic function of archeology? span You better believe there is, and it comes across all the time. I think it was important to start with the archeological piece, just the sheer volume of what they're finding in the material culture and archaeological sites that attest to synchronisms from the material culture in the Bible. I wish everyone could feel what I felt as I walked into that site and to feel just the weight and the enormity of there is so much here and such a great percentage of it speaks to a united monarchy and the biblical text being validated. There's a lot more to do, but I think this was a great first step in trying to answer this question. I think it's important to talk about Israel's enemies, especially the Philistines. They're mentioned all through 1st and 2nd Samuel. Israel's enemies play a key role in the nation demanding a king. They wanted a ruler that would go out and fight their battles for them like the other nations had. That is a part of the catalyst for them prompting Samuel to go to the Lord and find somebody for them. During the reigns of Saul, David, and Solomon, we read about a number of nations that they had battles with. But the one that keeps creeping up every couple of chapters are the Philistines. We are in one of the Philistine cities. This is the city of Ashdod. Now these ruins around us are actually from Crusader times, so they're much later than the time of the United Kingdom. Do we know where the Iron Age Ashdod was? Yes, a lot of those ruins are about a mile inland. This was one of the five cities of the Philistine Pentapolis. Ashdod and Ashkelon and Gaza are right here very close to the coast. Gath and Ekron are about eight or nine miles inland on the eastern side of the coastal plain. As we read through the book of 1 Samuel, the really first interaction we have with them comes with a battle between the Israelites and the Philistines a few miles north of here. The Israelites lost the first battle and so they thought they would take their good luck charm as the Ark of the Covenant into battle with them. Well, unfortunately, the Philistines captured the Ark and brought it to the city of Ashdod. Now that did not go well for them. It didn't. When the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord's mercy seat, is brought into Dagon's temple, and when the Philistines come in the next day, Dagon, this stone statue, is on its face in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And so you have their idol in a position of worship and adoration in front of God's mercy seat and they prop him back up and don't make a whole lot about it until the next day 
when he's down again, but his head has been removed and his hands have been removed and they're lying on the threshold of his temple. God has humiliated, he has defeated what these people are worshiping. Once the citizens of Ashdod got tired of that, they sent the Ark of the Covenant over to Gath and then it stayed there for a little while and they sent it to Ekron. And at that point, the Philistines made the decision, we need to send this back to the Israelites and they sent it up the Sorek Valley. It is so gorgeous right here just beyond here as you move east, it's still very fertile. Why would the Philistines want to continue heading east into the Jordan Rift Valley? Well, like any nation of that time, they want to expand their borders and they want to control more people. And of course, if they were able to conquer the Israelites, they would use them as slaves for their own good. Not only do we know where a lot of the major events took place on the Israel side of things, but even their enemies, they're historically grounded and rooted. We know where their locations were. The best way to understand the full relationship between the Philistines and the Israelites is to not only know the people, but also know the geography. And probably the best way to do that is to get above it. as well and of course uh, there's really no better place to do that uh, than from the air and so what we're going to do Jeremy is we're going to head over the uh, Shvela which was an area between the coastal plain and the hill country it was the border area between the Philistines who lived in the coastal plain and the Israelites which lived up in the hill country there was not very many ways of getting from the Mediterranean Sea for instance up to Jerusalem so those small valleys in the Shavay Law were extremely important. Whoever controlled the valley controlled the access. That's exactly right. And that just jumps out at you when you can see it from this perspective. We're looking west down, down the Soric Valley. The Philistines, after wanting to return the Ark back to the Israelites, put it on two milk cows on a cart up this valley. The citizens of Beth Shemesh saw the Ark coming down the valley and went down there and got it. Just south of the Soric Valley, we're coming up on the Ela Valley. Yeah, it's raining down here in the yes. Gila Valley. Not able to do Gila right now? Not right now. I can take you to Jerusalem if you want. Yeah, let's do Jerusalem. Okay. Jerusalem? Okay. Yeah. Okay, we are approaching the old city of Jerusalem. Okay, we're flying almost directly over the city of David right now, which was the original Jebusite city that David and Joab conquered. Wow. Wow, I see it. The Dome of the Rock, of course, sitting on top of the Temple Mount. It's amazing to see the, the landscape change, the topography change so quickly. This land is so small. I mean, it's only 40 to 50 miles wide and, uh, you know, about 150 miles from Dan to Beersheba. But uh, the differences in elevation and contours of the land is quite striking. Try for the Eagle Valley. Continue? Yes. Okay. The Gila Valley goes from east to west. You can see the entire battlefield right here. The Philistines were on the hill on this side of the valley. The Israelites were on the opposite side on that hill. You can see the valley there below us with the uh, brook running through the valley. This is the brook that David would have picked up his five smooth stones when he went out to fight against Goliath. But this is a beautiful, beautiful view of the Gila Valley. That's an incredible perspective right there. Where this famous battle took place. Yeah. Okay, in just a minute, we're going to come up on ancient Gath. Gath, of course, was the hometown of Goliath. It's kind of ironic to think about that Goliath, as a young boy, may have played in the Elah Brook, which was the same brook that uh, David chose stones out of that later killed him. Oh, this has been an adventure. I mean, how often do you get to do something like this? <laughs>
it was so helpful to meet Scott and to go to an actual archaeological dig and see how the archaeological process works. Then to go to the IAA warehouse and seeing everything they've got there. I loved how organized that place was. There's just so much there that I think speaks to the period of the judges leading up to the United Kingdom. And seeing Ashdod and realize that not just the Israelites left a footprint here in the land, but even the enemies that they fought, the Philistines, left footprints in all of those cities. The plane ride gave a perspective, just like you said, that you really needed to get above and see how the valleys moved, to see which way the roads went. All of that together acts as evidence that corroborates the first several chapters of 1 Samuel as the period of Judges winds down. The United Kingdom history transitions from the Judges to the Kings, where Samuel supposedly anoints this Benjamite named Saul. Is there any evidence that points to the existence of the kings of Israel specifically? Uh, yeah, I believe there is. I can think of three or four places that you will enjoy going to. In fact, one of them is the location of one of the most famous stories in the Bible. 